Okay, it looks like we are now live. So I'm going to take home, take back host um, status and going to welcome all of my folks here to, uh, to Hearst San Simeon State Historical Monument. Glad to have you all here today. Looks like I've got about 26 of us so far. Um, and looking, oh, if we get a few more, that would be wonderful. And we shall see who, who shows up. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so my name's Dan King. We're gonna spend about an hour looking around uh, Hearst San Simeon State Historical Monument, commonly called Hearst Castle. William Randolph Hearst, kind of, we think of him here as the world's first multimedia mogul. He built this hilltop estate for himself, starting in 1919, continued working on that for 28 years up until 1947, when he was forced by old age and illness to give up on construction and move from the hill, hilltop site. But uh, this was really sort of yeah, the passion project of his later years. We'll get to know Mr. Hurst himself a little bit throughout the, the tour, and you'll be getting to know his architect, Julia Morgan, really a uh, pivotal fig figure in California architecture, and a few other personalities along the way. Now, before I go any farther, I want to note that uh, I'm coming to you from a California State Park. This, this building behind me, Casa Grande of, of the uh, Hearst Estate, that uh, was the personal home of, of William Randolph Hearst, one of several. When, uh, he, when he was referring to Hearst Castle, he wasn't referring to this space, he was actually referring to the castle he had in the United Kingdom in Wales, near Cardiff, a place called St. Donuts. He liked to call this La Cuesta Encantada, the Enchanted Hill, or he would occasionally call it his ranch house at San Simeon or his hacienda at, at uh, Piedras Blancas. Now, as I said, it is no longer a private residence. Nobody living here today. It is a California state park, which means that it is available for you to come visit. And we would love to have you. I'm gonna take a moment to focus in on this patch on my jacket. And if you're capable of giving me a wave or something to say, yes, you, if you've ever seen that, that uh, blue circle it says California state parks, and that bear established 1864 because the very first California state parks was Yosemite, which is now, of course, National Park. Um, and, ah, thank you for that. And this, this along with another 279 spaces all around California, beaches, forest lands, deserts, mountains, and historical structures like this, all part of the California state park system, all here for you to get out and enjoy, to be inspired by, to learn things from, because that's what we're here for with California state parks is taking care of spaces for the, so that you can really start getting to see what your state has to offer you. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a view of what's in front of me because what's behind me is pretty, but I got a pretty nice view from where I'm standing. Um, and uh, you're looking down to the Pacific Ocean and San Simeon Bay there. And part of the reason why this, this house and this hilltop estate are where they are is because of those views. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, he told his, his architect early on in the construction process, the most important thing about the ranch is the views. I'm gonna give put up a map here so you can see where we are kind of midway up the central coast of California, about halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles. So lovely, beautiful ocean views. Uh, sadly, at the moment, it's hard to get at us from the northern part of California if you're coming along the ocean side because uh, Highway 1 did get beaten up a little bit by our winter rains. But uh, if you're coming from, from parts further north, you can take Highway 101 down to Paso Robles, where I come in from, and it's about an hour's drive over the hill to get here. And coming from Los Angeles, you could be coming right up the coast. All right, so let's get a little bit more of 
the house itself and a little bit of the story of how it got here. And I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a stroll so that we can see some more of what Mr. Hurst wanted, wanted to build. Now, actually I'm gonna show you that view again because it's not just because of the scenery that this house is here. It's also because William Randolph Hearst's father saw that bay there. He said, yes, it's very pretty. But he also said, hey, that's a nice deep water harbor halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, the best harbor between Monterey and Santa Barbara. And he was thinking, maybe we could have a port town here. And I'm gonna introduce you to some members of the Hearst family, get you a little bit of the story of how the Hearst family came into having land here and how that fits into California history because that does tie into a lot of the adventurous history of our state starting from, from the mid 1800s. This fellow with the beard, that is George Hearst. He is the, the one who came to California in 1850. He wanted to get rich in gold mining. It was part of the California gold rush. He spent 10 years looking for gold and he found his big fortune in gold mining in California. That didn't, he didn't get that until 1860. And when he did, it wasn't in California and it wasn't gold. It was silver in Nevada. Now, once he had made that first big fortune, he went back to his native state of Missouri, wanted to check up on his family. And while there, met up with a young school teacher, Phoebe Apperson. Half his age, and she had some ambitions to see the world beyond Missouri. She took a look at, at this guy who'd spent 10 years in mining camps, his clothes were a mess, and his beard was looking a little bit scragglier than that and had stuff stuck in it. And she said, You know something? He's a newly minted millionaire. I'll marry him now and I'll clean him up later. Well, they moved out to California. And in 1863 in San Francisco, they had their one and only child. That little baby boy there is William Randolph Hearst. He grew up to be this fellow. And it says at the bottom of the picture, proprietor and editor, New York Journal and San Francisco Examiner. This is because William Randolph Hearst, unlike his father, didn't wanna go into the mining business but he told his, his father, hey, you had picked up, you've picked up the San Francisco Examiner and it's making no money for you. Let me run it. And he did. And that turned into the first of 28 newspapers that William Randolph Hearst would own in his life. And that included papers in pretty much every major market. We think of him really as somebody who would be kind of like a, a modern a modern day Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Bill Gates, or maybe a combination of, of all of those guys. Lots of money, lots of influence, big controversy. And in his case, a big collector of art because what he really loved to do was to collect art and artifacts. And behind me, you are seeing some of the oldest on the property. And you're seeing four sculptures. And I'd like you folks to, Take a guess at where you might think these ones would be coming from. I'm gonna come in a little bit closer so you can see these a little bit in more detail. This very formal seated position, you are looking at the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. We've got four images of her here all of them between 3,200 and 3,600 years old. The very oldest one, this one that's closest to me, that one has got that solar disc on her head, showing her, her relationship to her father, the sun god Ra. And she's got this cobra on her forehead, the sacred Uraeus, symbol of on the crown of the pharaohs. Now, if any of you out there are Minecraft players, you might know about a particularly hard kind of stone called diorite. And if you know that stone from Minecraft, well, congratulations, you're seeing the real thing, four pieces of it. And that is such a very hard stone that even after 3000 years, there's all kinds of details that we can see on these sculptures. Gonna come in a little bit closer, gonna turn around here, you get that ocean view again for a moment. 
Ah, pretty out there. Oh, yes. Some of Mr. Hurst's roses because he did like his rose, his rose gardens, and we are in peak rose season right now. All right. But looking down be below those that arch of roses behind Sekhmet here, I'm going to come in on her face. And I think you can see her lion's whiskers, her mane and her ceremonial headdress, her necklace, all that visible after 3,000 years. Again, because she is carved in that very hard stone. I think my light is good that I can even show you one fun detail. There's an image next to her knees there. And that is a hieroglyph. Greek for hieros meaning sacred glyph, glyphos meaning carving. And that is a hieroglyph that is a dedication, dedicating these, sculpt, these sculptures to the great God, Lord of two lands. Because the great God, and that is letting you know that this is somebody, this is was created by somebody in charge of both upper and lower Egypt. All right, just a little bit of a sense of the uh, age and breadth of the art collection here, but I want to get you folks take. If you're going to be hanging out with this uh, terribly, terribly ferocious and powerful goddess, and she is so powerful that she is basically the protector of her father, the sun god Ra, also the war leader of the pharaohs in times of in times of battle. Uh, then you're going to be seeing a lot of aspects of what a powerful lady she is. And I want your opinion. I've got a little poll that I want you guys to, to take for me. And I want you to tell me what you think is the coolest aspect that you're finding of the goddess Sekhmet. And let's see if we got votes for her being the having the fiery breath that made all the deserts on earth in one giant ex exhalation. <laughs> Goddess of war and healing, because you know we all have to have our, ups, our, our positive sides and our, and our not so positive sides. Made out of that super hard diorite stone, protector and war leader of the pharaohs and, and daughter of the sun god Ra. All right, five more seconds to get you, your answers in on that poll. Four, three, two, one. All right, let's share out those results. All right, and I am seeing that people are liking that part where she can be with letting out that fiery breath. Okay, and thank you to my seven participants. All right, well, we're gonna stop looking at polls now and let's look at, oops, what is that? Let's have a look past Galatea on her dolphin there at the front, the name of course, the big house, the main house. This is the largest structure up here next to that sea view that we were looking at you would, you would have seen the edge of Casa del, del Mar, the house of the sea. There's, there are three different guest houses, each one named for its particular view. But I wanna to talk to you for a moment about how this one got created. So it looks a bit like a very old building. Looks a little bit, kind of looks like a church, yeah. I think so, at least. Um, or if it reminds folks of some of the missions of, of California, that's a, that's something Mr. Hurst wanted to, to make a reference to in uh, how he had this, this house built. Those bell towers behind me, 137 feet high. Now, and that's not even counting the nine foot tall 
weather vanes at the top of them. And at the front of that building, you're seeing that the gate has over it a Virgin Mary sculpture there. 13th century sandstone from, from Spain. We think of our sculptures a bit like Galatea here as all pure white stone or whatever color stone they happen to be. But in fact, quite often, people in, in, in ancient and, and old times like to paint their sculptures to look a little bit more lifelike. And if you look very closely at that lady, you can see little scraps of the paint that she would have been brightly colored in back in the old days. Either side of the door guarding it, we've got these Spanish hairy wild men from the 15th century. They look a little Chewbacca-like. Those guys are representing everything that is wild and fierce out there in the world. And their job is to protect the house from any kind of bad influence. 15th century limestone, when we go inside, let's only be thinking good thoughts, okay? All right, now, for all that it's got all this old decoration on the outside of it, and some of it's somewhat younger, the whole thing is faced with limestone from Utah and that peaked roof up there that is um, teak wood from, from modern day Thailand, carved in San Francisco by a fellow named Jules Supo. And uh, all of that, that's just a facade on the outside because let me show you what actually it's all made of. Because Julia Morgan, the architect of this place, one of the things that made her pretty, pretty significant and has been getting her more and more notice in recent years is that she worked in a material that was very resistant to a kind of danger we have here in California because we are subject to earthquakes here. And Julia Morgan figured out how to build things that can do a great job of resisting earthquakes. I want you to pretend that you have x-ray vision and that you're going to look inside of the walls of that house. And if you did, then you would see something that looks a little bit like this. You are seeing a network of steel bars, steel reinforcement bars called rebar for short, that are all encased in a big thick layer of cement. And that combination of steel and cement, steel reinforced concrete, that is, that is something that really revolutionized how to build here in California, how to make things very earthquake safe. Now, of course, if you're gonna build something, you need a plan. So you're seeing here, one of the drawings that Julia Morgan made for this house. Now I want you to look closely at the spot in between the two, the two bell towers there. And when you see the real thing, I want to see if anyone can spot what is a little difference here between the drawing and the finished product. Once you got going from the drawings, you have to then actually do the construction. And this is what it looked like while, this, while that house was under construction. You can see the bell tower is half built, the front of the building partially up. And you can see that instead of, instead of looking at all that fancy cut stone on the outside, you are looking at that steel re reinforced concrete that makes the core of this entire building. And here's the whole thing finished. And look in between the bell towers and notice that up above that teakwood cornice there, there's an entire third story of the building that was not part of, uh, excuse me, actually fourth story of the building that was not part of the original plans. William Randolph Hearst had a tendency to take a look at something and say, hey, that's great. Let's make it bigger. All right. I need you guys to now do a little bit of exploring with me what it is makes this concrete, how this concrete works so that we can have such an earthquake safe building, okay? So first up, you guys have to do a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, quit poking buttons because I need your arms to go as high as those bell towers can go. See if you can stretch as high as those bell towers. 
Yeah. Yeah, look, good stretch there. Okay, now push them out. See if we can push those bell towers out. Nope, can't push those bell towers out. They're, they're that strong. Well, here's part of how that works. Take the palms of your hands, put them together, and push. Push in on your palms. And there is a fancy scientific name for that force you just exerted by pushing on your palms. That's called compression. And why do your arms not just collapse like jello when you're pushing like that? Because of those long bones in your arms. Those long bones are really good at resisting compression, just like cement in that building is good at resisting compression. Okay, demo number two, take your fingers, hook, make hooks out of them, hook them together, and pull against each hand, pull each hand against the other. The fancy name for that kind of, kind of force is called tension, that pulling force, tension. And what's really good at resisting tension is the steel bars that are inside of that building. Well, that, that combination, of the concrete that's good at resisting compression, kind of like your bones, and the steel that's good at resisting tension, kind of like your muscles, that is what helps that building. This that helps you if you didn't have your skeleton resisting that compression pushing you into the ground, you can collapse on the ground like a pool of gel. But it also takes muscle resisting any pulling strain, pulling strain one side or the other. You standing up just the same way that concrete and steel reinforcement kept that building standing up. And here one year ago, six point six earthquake. The concrete held totally without a scratch on the building. Okay, let us take a little stroll. I still have, oh good, thank patience. You can see a little bit of the roof of Casa del, of Casa del, uh, okay, of Casa del, del Mar there, the one that looks out towards the ocean. And we're gonna stroll around the gardens here, getting a little bit of the look at, at the pond, that front gate. We're not going to go. There is a 2,000 year old floor just inside of that gate. So that's not why we're not going to walk in through there. We're going to go in through a side door. Behind me, you're seeing a little bit of the view to the north that gives Casa del Monte its name because it looks out at the mountains. Okay, I do want to introduce you as we go to another of our personalities here. I'd like you to meet our architect. And that would be Julia Morgan, who first did some of her studying at University of California, Berkeley, one of the first women to graduate from that school. She went on, this is not her at Berkeley, she, that's a few years later than that. She went on to study in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and you are seeing her here standing in front of Notre Dame Cathedral in she is the architecture. She's going to be thinking about how that might inspire her to create the things that she will build later in her life. Now she does end up building a great many buildings. This is project number 503 for her out of over 700 building projects she does in her life. Small houses, big houses. 
She even starts off with a bell tower in Northern California in Oakland at Mills College. And that building survives the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. That's one of the things that gets people really paying attention and saying, hey, this, this person, she knows how to build and we should try and have her build things for us. Well, not only can, can she do the, the walls to stand up and the outside looking good, she's pretty good at making the inside look all right as well. Welcome to the assembly room, basically the living room of William Randolph Hearst House. As you can see, his taste in decorating with antique, with antique art and furniture extends inside. Now, I'm gonna take you to, to where you're gonna see one of the objects, the oldest objects in this room. But along the way, you're gonna to get to see those big decorative items up on the walls. The large pictures are actually not paintings. Those are pictures created out of fabric, tapestries. And to give you a little bit of a, of a sense of the size of the room and of the things in it, I'm gonna walk over to that fireplace. So you can see that if I, could, if I could get through this grill, I would be able to stand up inside of that fireplace. That's how big everything is here. It's uh, 83 feet long, this room. Put, made to that size specifically to be able to hold the big tapestries on those high walls and not have them crowd too much in on that 16th century French fireplace there. All right, but I'm gonna spin the view around now because I want you to see, there's that gate that we were standing outside of just a few minutes ago, but looking down at the floor, you can see a picture on that floor and that picture basically looking like some kind of a mer person merman or mer creature some kind of sea, sea critter um, carrying a two-tined fork and surrounded by other sea creatures what you're looking at there is a roman mosaic like the ones that were found in the ruins of pompeii and herculaneum this picture made out of thousands of tiny, tiny stones. I'm going to show you a close up of this fish here. And I'm gonna bring my hand in close for scale. And you can see how small each of those stones about the size of my fingernail and tens of thousands of them. Now, there's a bunch of scaffolding up there because as you can imagine, with a place as big as this, full of artwork as old as this, the job of taking care of everything is constant. And because of that, I work with some people who've got some really interesting and cool skills, among them, the folks from the Department of Conservation and Collections, people whose job it is to take care of 500 year old pieces of fabric, people who know how to clean a painting that's 400 years old and make sure that it stays good for another, for another few hundred years and stays beautiful. And one of the folks who has retired from that business came on one of our tours a little while ago, a few months back. He was telling me what it took to do a huge job on that mosaic floor he said that they took drills and drilled underneath the concrete on this floor. They put in a huge cylinder that was as wide as the whole room to roll that whole floor onto the outside of the cylinder. And then they took all of those stones apart individually, cleaned each one, labeled them, got them all put back together in exactly the order that they had taken them out in. 
After that, they said, you know something, that was a really big job. We don't wanna to have to do that again anytime soon. So maybe you guys should stop walking on it. Well, okay, I guess they've got a point there. All right. Um, now I'm gonna point out because I'm a fan of some of the stories that you can get out of the artworks here. William Randolph Hearst, he said that he liked the tapestries in this place because of the stories they told. You're seeing part of the stories of a Roman general Scipio Africanus here. And if anyone likes horses, they might like Poseidon, Roman god of the sea there, creating the very first horse. There's a contest between the deities and over who's gonna make the coolest gift for humanity. Poseidon's entry in that is to take his three-tined trident, trident fork, slam it into that rock and out pops the very first horse in existence. And that is how we have horses in this world, at least according to Greek mythology. Well, if you like horses, now you know who to thank. All right. Um, various various other bits of mythology all over the place. Um, you saw one of the Venus sculptures behind me there. And I'm going to take us towards that big scissors lift to point out the one that kind of hides in a corner, but I like her best because you are looking at image of Venus, we think, from the fourth century or so BCE. Now, of course, she is not held up quite as well as Sekhmet. She's made out of softer stone, marble, and that because of that, she's lost her head, her arms, her legs. She's pretty much nothing left but a torso. But they were good enough sculptors that that, that torso even is a pretty fine looking piece of art. Okay. Next up, we're going to next up, we're going to be heading for the dining room. And those of you who are fans of the Harry Potter movies, if you're thinking, hey, somehow or other I suddenly found myself in the Great Hall of Hogwarts, well, I got a little bit of a backstory for you on this. When Hollywood producers were looking for a way to create a space for those movies. They said, where can we do some research to get a good idea for what we want it to look like? And they came here to Hearst Castle to get some ideas. All right, now, um, just like the previous room, it does have tapestries on the walls. Also, just like the previous room, wood paneling. And I'm gonna focus in a little bit closer on the wood paneling that's behind me here. You can see it's got all this crazy intricate carving all over it, but it's also got chairs attached. Hey, what's going on with that? Well, on this side of the room, you can see There is a chair, there is a chair folded down and one folded up. Now, hundreds of years ago, when these were choir stalls in a Spanish church, these would have been where clergy would have been standing or sitting during that long Roman Catholic religious service, that mass. And sometimes they would get to sit down on a nice cozy cushion, but sometimes, they would have to stand for a long time to sing and pray in Latin. But because some of those nuns, those, those monks were not so, so young, they got what they called the mercy seat, this little half seat that they could sort of lean up against. And if they fluffed out their robes, no one would notice that they weren't 100% standing up. Okay, well, I wanna give you folks a little bit more of a sense of what it takes to decorate this hall. 
Mr. Hurst, he really liked ceilings taken from older buildings. And in this case, we're looking at carvings taken from Italian churches, 16th century wood carving. All of this done in very hard woods that allows lots and lots of detail on all of those saints. Kind of in the middle, we've got the Virgin Mary standing on her, her half moon. And then down below her feet, St. George slaying the dragon there. Okay, we talked about horses. How do we feel about horse races? Because these flags up above me, these came from an Italian horse race that has been run since at least the 1300s. There are 17 neighborhoods in the, the, the town of Siena. Each one, call, they're all called the Contrade. And every summer they have the Palio de, de Contrade or the Palio de Siena, where each of those neighborhoods brings out their flag with their particular colors and, and symbolic animal, the giraffe, the, the caterpillar, the tortoise, the, the she-wolf, and have loads of big festivities in the streets of the town. And the, it all caps off with a horse race that's run around a very small central square. And whichever neighborhood's horse wins the race gets to plant their, their flag in, in the central square for the rest of the year. Now, I did say they they started doing this sometime in the 1300s or thereabouts. Records aren't 100% clear on that. They've been doing that all the way until last August. And I don't have August's winner, but I'm going to show you folks over here, this yellow and, oops, where are you? There you are. Um, this yellow and red, oops, hey, where are you? There you are. That yellow and red flag with the dragon on it. Il Drago, winner of July's race of 2022 of the Palio de Siena. All right. Um, now, crazy question for you all. Taking a look at this room. Would you think of this room as being wider or taller? If you're saying taller, then you have been fooled by a little bit of an optical illusion because Julia Morgan has designed this one to have all of the lines be very, hor be very vertical in this room. Very few horizontal lines little bit on the fireplace there but there's that pointed arch on the fireplace you see it again on the doors you see it again on those choir stalls you see it again on the windows and you even see it on the 16th century spanish quite um church church grill the reja and those vertical lines give us that sense of upward movement in everything because the Gothic style that this room is designed in wants us to have our eyes constantly drawn upwards towards the heavens. Hey, there's those saints again. All right. Um, not to get too carried away with religion here, but there's so much of it in the room. Again, we've got those, those tapestries on the walls. And behind me, you are seeing a scene woven of a story from the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel meeting King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And what I really wanna do is point out to you all what it takes to create all of these designs. Cause I'm gonna come in a little bit closer on that horse and rider. And you're gonna see how all of that color, all of these designs are formed out of layers and layers of threads of different colors. There is our prophet in the center there. And you can see that all of his, the different colors of his clothes, of his hair and his face, that is all made by bringing different colors of thread to the top of the fabric, 
which means that that fabric is really a very thick piece of fabric to have all of those colors all layered in. All right. So we've talked a little bit about um, Mr. Hurst's art collection. I want to give you folks another chance to get a bit of a sense of the construction of this place. And for that, we're going to take a brief detour back through that assembly room. Now, looking at the walls there, in here, it looks a little bit like these walls are made out of big blocks of stone. That's actually just the place where they have taken that concrete that the walls are made of, scored it so that you can see the shapes of, of blocks, but that's really just scratched into the wall. All right. Um, coming back around our assembly room here. Pausing for a little bit of that history for you. Um, now, I said that these four large tapestries are part of what the room was designed specifically to hold. And one of the reasons that Mr. Hurst wanted those was because they are telling a story. And they're telling the story of the young fellow who is up in the center of that tapestry. If you look close, you can see a, a young guy up on a horse. He's got a blue cape with um, stars on it. Looks a little bit like a superhero, but he's in a big battle there. And you may be able to see a fellow who's on the ground has a terrible cut on his head. That is his father, because you are looking at Scipio, Scipio Minor and Scipio Major, two Roman generals. Um, the son has not yet been promoted, but he's trying to help his dad who's been knocked over in the battle. Well, I'm gonna take us to the other side of the room and spin that, spin that around for you again so you can see how same blue cloak, same yellow, same gold stars on it. But now our young fellow Scipio Africanus has got his beard grown in because he's gotten a little bit older and he's the one who's leading the charge in the battle. And for those of you who are studying your Greek and Roman history and, and your ancient civilizations in your social studies classes, I'm gonna zoom in for a moment on a couple of the fellows who are behind Mr. Scipio there, because you can see on those shields, SPQR. And look out for those letters anytime you're looking at depictions of Romans, because you'll see that as very important letters to them because it stands for the Senate and People of Rome, Senato e Popolo per Roma. All righty. Um, and again, uh, so many layers of story that you can find around here. We're only even beginning to scratch the surface. I'm going to take us back outside and we're going to get a little bit of a sense of both the construction and some of the um, and some more of Mr. Hurst's collection and more of those stories that turn up in it. A little pause for a poker game at Mr. Hurst's poker table there. Now, if you want to get up to the upper layer levels of this house, you would need to take a ride in this 1920s Otis elevator. I don't recommend using it though, because in 1929, a former first lady rode that elevator. 
Grace Coolidge, her husband, former president Calvin Coolidge was here. And when she wanted to get up to her, to her room up on the third floor, the elevator broke on her. She was stuck inside there for two hours. And here's, here's one of the crazy things. And I think I said that construction on this building started in 1919 on this whole complex of buildings. Well, Mr. Hurst kept building up until 1947. And all during that time, you would probably have found most of the time somebody hammering or sawing or running a concrete mixer so that it would be very hard to find a quiet moment here. All right, I'm gonna turn around to show you folks. Oh. My, uh, one of my colleagues is taking some of our many visitors from all over the world around because we do get visitors from all over the place. We would love to have you here live and I'm very happy to have you here digitally at least. Now you can see that that door that they're walking into is surrounded by fancy decorations, cut stone all over the walls, but that is just the decoration on the outside. Because if we look over here at the north wing, you see what this house is actually made of. There's that steel reinforced concrete. Now, if you see all those horizontal lines on the side of it, what you're seeing is the marks left by the mold that it takes to make those walls. Because think about if your parents have ever made jello and they have taken that runny gelatin and poured it into a mold. Well, once that, that gelatin hardens up to make dessert, take away the mold and the whole shape of the mold is gonna be left there. Similarly with concrete, you have to pour liquid runny mushy concrete into a box usually made of wood they call those forms and coming a little bit closer, not only can you see the marks of where the edges of the boards were, but you can even see wood grain, wood grain from those boards. You can even see a knot hole where one of those boards had a knot hole in it. Yep, there was a, uh, there was an author who wrote books. And if any of you have ever read some books called the Madeleine books about a little girl in Paris, well, that author, he came here and he looked at these walls and he said, it's a crazy thing how every space is covered with ornamentation. Think about that living room with gold leaf on the walls, carving on the walls, carving on the ceilings. And then you go into the spaces where he said, it looks like the cement is still wet and you can see the wood grain from the form boards. Looking up, you can even see little wires sticking out that would have been part of keeping all of that steel reinforcement in place. And all that was supposed to get covered up. Why did this North Wing never get the fancy decorative treatment on the outside? Well, it's because Mr. Hurst kept changing his mind uh, how, about how big he wanted things to be. That was supposed to be one story high. Then he changed his mind. Oh, let's make it three stories tall. This is part of why it took 28 years to build here and none of this is even completely finished. All right. Uh, I'm gonna show you folks as we move towards, well, okay, first up, I guess, Let's have a quick look at another of Mr. Hurst's antiquities. He really loves these big marble boxes. And I'm gonna hold the camera up so you can see that it's got a space inside. And it's kind of long and skinny, very fancily decorated. And it's got this portion that got broken somewhere along the line. Well, what's gonna go inside of a big box like this? You are looking essentially 
at someone's coffin. Fancy word for that, sarcophagus. This one was meant to sit above ground. It had a lid on it. Now, one of the reasons why we know that this is the real deal 2000 year old uh, Roman sarcophagus is because of that break on the side there. Because there used to be a lid there when the person who was, who was buried in this was put in there, they probably had a few valuable things on them. Thousand, long time afterwards, after their, their body had dissolved and decomposed away, probably not even much left of their bones, someone decided they wanted to take a look at what was on the inside of this, see if there, there was any valuable stuff in there with, with that person's bones. And we think that that break is where they would have slid a chisel under or a crowbar underneath the edge to try and pry off that lid so they could see what was inside. All right. Uh, now I said, Mr. Hurst liked to collect all kinds of things, sarcophagi, old artworks, sculptures. He even liked to collect animals of all different varieties. Many of them wild animals, many of them wild animals from places far off. And we're going to have a quick look at his zoo. Because he had bears. If you were to come here, you would pass a set of big concrete enclosures. And that would be where his polar bears lived. He also had some, some African lions running free out on a lot of the open, open pasture land here. He would have American bison. Sambar deer from India and giraffes, reindeer, and even zebras. And the funny thing is that Mr. Hurst had to give up a lot of his animals in 1937. It was the Great Depression and he had spent a great deal of money and just like everybody else in the world, he was realizing that, hey, the economy was tough. It was hard to, to make a living. His banker said, you have to stop spending so much money. So he had to give away his, his uh, animals to zoos. But when he did, many of the zebras got out. And if you come and visit today, you can see zebras like this roaming around the hillsides of California. Of course, we also have foxes like this that you can see all over California and California deer. And they have a whole lot of that space out beyond the hilltop here that they get to explore because Hearst Ranch started out with George Hearst buying 40,000 acres, but the family kept buying until they got up to 250,000. And if you can see very, very faintly in the distance, the farthest hill from there, is one called Pimcolam by Salinan people, also called Mount Junipero Serra. And that was the very northern boundary of the property, 35 miles away from here. These days, it's part of Fort Hunter Liggett because when Mr. Hurst was readjusting his finances, he sold over 100,000 acres to the federal government. And that made the army base of Fort, Fort Hunter Liggett and the National Guard base of, of Camp Roberts. All right. Now it's that view to the mountains that gives this little house here its name. That is Casa del, del Monte. And we're going to have a little stroll along in front of it to see a couple more of the art objects from the collection here. And we're going to end up with what a lot of people consider one of their favorites. Now, again, Casa del Monte, the smallest of the, of the guest houses here, 2,500 square feet. If Mr. Hurst was, was capable of sticking with a plan, everything here would have been about this size. Well, he was not so good at sticking with a plan. Okay, and we have arrived at another sarcophagus, but this one has a whole bunch of figures on it. And I want you to think in terms of what are the things that you occasionally need a little bit of 
inspiration for because nine of the people on this sarcophagus are the muses, Greek deities in charge of giving you good ideas. And I'm gonna let you know who they are by putting up a poll and I want you to tell me who you think you need inspiration from to help you become that little bit more accomplished, that little bit smarter, so that you can have, whoops, hold on, having trouble with pushing buttons here. Here we go. All right. Who do you need to inspire you? Do you need inspiration from Polyhymnia, goddess of sacred and heroic hymns, Euterpe in charge of music and lyric poetry, or maybe Talia in charge of comedy and pastoral poetry? Oh, wow. Talia is getting a lot of friends there. Um, you also could have some help from Mel Pomene in charge of tragedy or Arato in charge of love. And nobody wants love. Nobody wants love. No. Um, Calliope in charge in charge of epic poetry or Terpsichore in charge of dance and choral song or perhaps Irania in charge of astronomy or Cleo in charge of history. All right. Let's take a couple seconds more to put in our votes. Three, two, one, and. Okay, it is a runaway favorite for um, Talia in, in charge of comedy and pastoral poetry. All right. Well, um, I think I've got just enough time for us to see the last stop on our tour today. We are gonna take a little stroll past Casa del Sol. That one is the last of the guest houses that we haven't looked at yet. That one is named because it has got the view looking out to the sunset. Also a great place to go looking for planets in the evening sky. I always like to go looking for Venus and Mercury in the evening sky, or I can just say hello to Venus right there. Mercury was sitting opposite from that, was sitting just opposite from that uh, sarcophagus there. But we met up with Poseidon inside of the assembly room. Well, we have one more place where we're gonna have a little bit of a check-in with the deity. But instead of getting the Greek version Poseidon of the, of the God of the Oceans, we're gonna get that same God of the Oceans, but by his Roman name, Neptune, because you are looking down at the Neptune swimming pool. Over 100 feet long, 345,000 gallons of water in there. I'm gonna spin us around a moment so I can be in the picture too. And down at that end, it is three and a half feet deep. Down at this end, 10 feet deep. Uh, and again, with that temple, you're getting that combination of old and new that Julia Morgan was so famous for, 20th century steel reinforced concrete for the base, a, a 1500s Italian limestone sculpture of the god Neptune standing on top of granite columns and marble capitals on top of them that are 1600 to 2000 years old. All right, well, I think that practically wraps up the time I have to take you folks around and show you things. I'm hoping that you've been enjoying this, this little wander through Mr. Mr. Hearst Castle here and enjoying a bit of Julia Morgan's creation. And wanna encourage you all to get out and enjoy what your California State Parks has for you. Because not only do we have historic structures like this, just out there at Piedras Blancas, among our beaches, we have protected protected land beach areas for our California elephant seals. We have all kinds of varieties of things that you can be enjoying and it's all here for you. So get out and enjoy your California State Parks. And again, I want to thank you all for being such great folks to, to wander around with today and show off what we have here for you.
You guys have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon and wonderful, wonderful rest of your school school year and wonderful summer vacations. Come, come by live if you can, and we'd love to see you.